So last month, a new Halloween movie came out, and lots of people didn't like it very much. I didn't think it was all that great myself, but some people, some people really didn't like it. Some people really didn't like it so much that they started a petition on Change.org to force the filmmakers to reshoot the movie. A petition that, as of the day I'm shooting this video, has garnered nearly 15,000 signatures. This petition is one of several to have been created over the past few years. Disgruntled fans have also started petitions about, to name a few examples, the final season of Game of Thrones, the Star Wars sequel trilogy, and the current slate of Star Trek shows demanding that they be remade or reshot or removed from whatever canon they belong to. Obviously, none of these petitions went anywhere or are going anywhere. HBO isn't going to remake the last season of Game of Thrones. Disney isn't going to remake the Star Wars sequels. Paramount isn't going to decanonize any of the current Star Trek shows. And Universal isn't going to demand reshoots of Halloween Ends. I don't have a problem with petitions like these because I think they have a chance to actually impact anything, nor do I have a problem with petitions like these because I necessarily disagree with them. Like I said, I didn't think Halloween Ends was that good either. I've never seen Game of Thrones. Everything I've ever heard about it makes it seem like the exact opposite of a show I would like, and I think most of the wailing and gnashing of teeth over the recent Star Wars and Star Trek stuff is unwarranted and way over the top, but I certainly understand being excited to see a particular movie or show and then feeling disappointed when it turns out to be an utter piece of garbage. Yes, I'm talking about you. 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 I have a problem with petitions like these because of what they exemplify, because of the attitude that cultivates them, propagates them, enables them to grow. I have a problem with the entitlement of fans who make and sign and share petitions like these. And the petitions aren't the only forms of expression for this fan entitlement. As we all know, shit, Zack Snyder still trends on Twitter every couple of days for no reason other than his most cultishly devoted followers just can't fucking let it go. And look, up to a point I understand, I get it, I even expect it. Many of us now live in an on-demand world. Thanks to streaming services and wireless high-speed internet, we can watch the TV shows and movies that interest us and skip the rest. It's not just entertainment either. If I'm hungry, I can pull out my phone, tap on Grubhub or DoorDash or some other delivery app, order from a local restaurant, and have someone bring it to me. I can eat whatever I want, and I don't even have to leave the house. And if I do want to leave the house and I need a ride, I can tap on a ride-sharing app and have someone come pick me up and take me wherever I want to go. It's effortless. It's convenient. It's really easy to get used to. We humans have a natural tendency to act as though the world revolves around us to begin with, and shit like this, as useful as it is, only exacerbates that tendency. Growing accustomed to having everything available on demand can make you a more demanding person, whether you realize it or not. That doesn't make it okay. We need to be aware of it and guard against it, but it's understandable. However, not all of the increase in fan entitlement, and I do feel it's gotten worse, but that's just my own sense of it. I haven't studied it scientifically, and I'm not trying to make any sort of definitive statement. Not all of it is due to the increasingly on-demand nature of how we consume media. Some of it has been encouraged by the creators of that media. As the level of fan entitlement has grown in recent years, so has the amount of fan service. And while fan service has become much more visible and pervasive in the last decade or so, it began trending upward long before that. I'll tell you where I first noticed it. Professional wrestling. Specifically, WCW Monday Nitro, September 14th, 1998. 
That's the night Ric Flair returned to television after a lengthy absence caused by a real-life conflict with company management. Flair's backstage tensions with WCW president Eric Bischoff were made a part of the show as Flair walked to the ring to thunderous cheers and reformed his legendary group, the Four Horsemen. This was a big deal at the time. Flair was one of the most respected and beloved wrestlers in the business and hadn't appeared on TV since April of that year. During the months he was gone, live crowds at WCW events all across the country would chant, We Want Flair, sometimes so loudly that it threatened to drown out the announcers. When Flair finally came back on September 14th, he was visibly moved by the thousands of cheering fans and offered heartfelt appreciation, telling the crowd, I know that the 25 years I spent trying to make you happy every night of your life was worth every damn minute of it. It was quite a moment. It felt organic. It felt real. It was the sort of thing wrestling fans didn't see very often back then. But... It became the sort of thing wrestling fans saw a lot more often after that. Today, it's not at all unusual for a wrestler to take the microphone and just gush with appreciation for the fans. Sometimes this is prompted by real-life issues similar to Flair's, and sometimes it's just another part of a prearranged storyline, but whatever the individual reasons, it's something that happens a lot in the present day, but that rarely ever happened when I was a kid. We step into this ring, and we do what we do for you, the wrestler will say, usually to the appreciative cheers and applause of the fans. It's a message you can find virtually verbatim in recent social media posts from wrestler-turned-biggest-movie-star in the world, Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who shared his gratitude for the successful opening of his film, Black Adam, declaring, Enjoy the movie. We made it for you. And, in the end, the only thing that matters to me is sending the people home happy. Not that there's anything wrong with such statements, necessarily. It's nice to say thank you, even if you're a big-time celebrity saying thank you to your supporters. In fact, maybe especially then. But there's a cynic in me that can't help but view these explicit and effusive expressions of gratitude, at least in part, as calculated attempts to win the favor of their audience, regardless of the quality of their work. It's flattery. It's pandering. And just like having things available on demand, the more you're pandered to, the more you get used to it, and the more you come to expect it. Most fan service, of course, doesn't come in the form of actors and filmmakers expressing gratitude to the audience on social media. It's embedded in the work itself in the form of Easter eggs, winking jokes or references inserted into a work for the amusement and or appreciation of fans who recognize them, and appearances from fan-favorite characters and plots contrived in such a way to be pleasing to the audience or at least certain segments of the audience. Broadly speaking, fan service refers to the aspects of films and TV shows and works and other media that are included because they've been calculated to, as The Rock might say, send the people home happy. And here's the thing, if it's done right, in a way that isn't intrusive or obnoxious or distracting, and if it's done in moderation, there's nothing wrong with it. When it's done ham-fistedly and excessively, fan service not only compromises the quality of the stories in which it appears, it sends the message to some fans that they have the right to demand that the media they consume be to their liking. Hence, the petitions I mentioned at the start of the video, and the relentless, aggressive, and apparently never-to-be-satisfied campaigning from Zack Snyder cultists. First, they wanted the Snyder Cut of Justice League, and then, when they got that, they immediately moved on to demanding that Snyder be hired to direct more Justice League movies, and that he and he alone be allowed to direct 
future Superman movies, and I'm sure at some point they'll also demand that the negatives of all non-Snyder-directed superhero movies be piled up and burned if they haven't already. This sense of audience entitlement extends beyond movies and TV shows to live events. In 2010, Steve Martin was being interviewed on stage at the 92nd Street Y in New York City. The talk was supposed to focus on Martin's newly published novel, as well as his experiences as an art collector, but midway through, the interviewer was handed a note instructing her to shift gears and instead begin asking Martin about his acting and comedy career. Apparently, members of the audience had been emailing the Y during the event to complain about how boring they found the talk, demanding that Martin be prompted to talk about things they considered more interesting. In certain venues, this kind of audience participation isn't such a problem and is even encouraged. Remember I said that pro wrestling fans had been chanting for the absent Ric Flair for months before he made his return to WCW in 1998. In 2013, fans of the WWE did the same thing, only even more insistently on behalf of Brian Danielson, known as Daniel Bryan at the time, a phenomenally talented wrestler who the fans, rightly, I think, regarded as being underutilized by the company. As a result of the vocal and relentless support of the fans, Danielson won the WWE World Championship in the main event of the following year's WrestleMania. But not every form of entertainment operates like this, nor should it. If you go see a production of Hamilton and get pissed because Burr wins the duel at the end, sorry, spoiler alert for Hamilton and history, you can feel however you feel about it. But it's completely unreasonable for you to demand that the show change to send you home happy. When you buy a ticket to a show or a movie, you're buying the right to see the work, not the right to have the work meet your expectations or demands. I've seen movies that I haven't liked, a lot of them. I've gone into a theater or clicked on a title on a streaming service and settled in with high expectations only to end up dismayed and disappointed. Seeing the second Star Wars prequel, Attack of the Clones, when it opened in 2002, comes to mind. One of the most deflating and depressing movie-going experiences I've ever had, although Batman v Superman Dawn of Justice comes close. And yet not once did the thought ever enter my mind, hey, all of us who didn't like this movie should petition the studio to make it again. That's not how this works. Satisfaction is not guaranteed. It never has been. And anyone who doesn't understand that or refuses to accept that is acting like a child. From where I'm standing, the Star Wars prequels at their best are way, way shittier than the sequels at their worst. And if I didn't get to demand a do-over for the prequels, you don't get to demand one for the sequels, you fucking crybabies. It's a level of arrogant presumption I still <laughs> have difficulty wrapping my head around. It's like going to a baseball game and demanding your money back if your team doesn't win. No, actually, it's worse than that. It's like going to a baseball game, seeing your team lose, and then petitioning the league to erase that game from the record and demanding that it be played over again, and again, if necessary, until your team wins. My favorite artist to have ever worked on a Star Trek project is Nicholas Meyer. He directed and co-wrote Star Trek II, co-wrote Star Trek IV, and directed and co-wrote Star Trek VI. And Nicholas Meyer has been saying for years that art is a dictatorship. In a 2017 interview with IndieWire, he said, You don't have to watch it. You can turn it off. You cannot buy a ticket, but if you go to see a movie that I make or read a book that I write, then it's mine and you either sign on for the cruise or you don't. The article then quotes from a talk Meyer gave to a group of Star Trek fans where he said, With all due respect, I don't care what you think. Only because you don't know what you think. If it had been up to you, Spock wouldn't have died. You don't know what you love until you get it. <sighs> I love him. Maybe that strikes some of you as arrogant, but 
God damn do I wish that attitude was more prevalent among people making creative decisions in film and television today. I want less pandering and sucking up to the fans, fewer attempts to guess what the fans want, and more directors and writers and actors telling the stories they want to tell the way they think those stories should be told, with the confidence that if they do their jobs properly, those stories will find their audiences. It won't always work out. There will still be shitty art, just as there has always been, and there will still be great art that fails to find an audience, but at least it will be the product of people trying to tell their story, not performing the artistic equivalent of assembling a fucking sandwich at Subway. I've taken a few writing classes in my time, and I've noticed that one of the most difficult concepts for young writers to grasp is the idea that the universal lies in the specific. If you want people to identify with your story, your characters, make it specific. Make it unique. Make it concrete. Because if you do all those things, and you do them well, then your story will feel real, and people in your audience will connect the experiences of your characters to their own experiences, even if those experiences differ wildly in the details. We will make connections. We will recall times where we felt similar emotions. We will imagine that we know how the character feels, and hopefully we will become invested in the story. This is an example of how our tendency to make everything about ourselves works to the artist's advantage. But if your story lacks those details, if your writing is vague and generalized, then there's nothing for your audience to grab hold of. There's nothing that feels real, that they can connect to. Excessive and poorly executed fan service is destructive to storytelling for the same reason. If an artist is too preoccupied with anticipating the desires of the audience and trying to make them happy, they won't be focused on telling their story the way it needs to be told. And the result, more times often than not, will be a story that isn't worth paying attention to. The best form of fan service, the most reliable way to send the people home happy, is to give them a good story. Don't worry about what the audience wants, what the audience will think. Fuck the audience. Tell your story the way it needs to be told. Trust that if you do your job, it will find its audience. On the other side of the coin, the best thing that we as fans can remember is that while we have every right to feel however we feel about the media we consume, we don't have the right to demand that the creators of those works cater to our every whim. We're free to not like things, we're free to voice our opinions, and we should, hopefully in ways that are articulate and constructive, but we should also never lose sight of the fact that artists don't owe it to us to make things we like. Artists owe paying audiences the work they've paid to see. Artists don't owe audiences work that has been tailored to meet all of their demands. That's not art. That's sandwich art. So, if you saw the new Halloween movie, or the Star Wars sequels, or one of the new Star Trek shows, or a discussion at the 92nd Street Y, or last week's episode of WWE Monday Night Raw, or AEW Dynamite, or anything else, and you didn't like it, great! You're allowed not to like it. Express yourself. Complain. Cry and moan about it until you pass out on your keyboard from sheer exhaustion. But instead of starting a petition, or sending a pissy email, or tweeting a demand that the creators erase the offending work and do it again, only this time more to your satisfaction, do yourself and everyone else a favor and just watch something else. There's other stuff. Stuff that you will like. Stuff that will make you laugh or cry. Stuff that will thrill you or scare you or make you think a film or a show or a book or a song or something that you can discover and appreciate, and fall in love with. It's out there. Trust me. All you have to do is look for it.